So recently I opened Cursor and I tried creating a brand new GitHub repository using plain natural language. And the result, well, it gave me a nice list of steps and it told me to open the GitHub website. Thanks, I guess. Bruh. But what is if I could do it right here? No terminal, just by typing, create a repo, make it private and call it subscribe now. Clicking a accept button and boom. Done. You see, LLMs are amazing at talking, but doing not so much. And that's where MCP comes into play. But now here's the real question. What is MCP? Why do we need it? And how does it work behind the scenes? Well, to answer that, we have to go back a bit and look at the evolution of generative AI. So it all started around 2021 when OpenAI released ChatGPT to the public with GPT 3.5. And this was the start to all of this madness. So the idea is relatively simple. We have an input. A user creates an input, like for example, what is 2 plus 1? Then the LLM, in this case Claude, analyzes the question and generates a response, an output. This output would be 3 quick maths. But what's the problem with this basic setup? Well, an LLM only has training data, only historic training data. So if I would now say, or if I would create an input, which would be, hey, what is the weather in Berlin? This LLM would fail because again, we only have historic data. Let me show it to you. So right here, I'm in Claude. I asked, hey, how is the weather in Berlin? And Claude said, hey, my knowledge has a cutoff date of October, 2024. So this means Claude does not get or does not have real-time functionality. And the same thing is true for our GitHub example. If I would have an input which would be, hey, create a brand new repo which is private, this LLM would fail because it's not agentic. It does not have access to external resources. It only has its training data. And that's a huge problem. And this is where we pretty much got generative AI version 2. That's how I call it. So now, for example, here we have perplexity. And if I go to perplexity and say, hey, how is the weather in Berlin? It will actually search the web and get me a response, meaning 14 degrees. So let's again go back. How does this diagram look like? So we again have our input. What is the weather? Our LLM gets this question, this input, it analyzes it and it will see, hey, the user tries to get real-time info. This does not work. I only have historic data. So what is if I could call a tool which could get the info for me? And this is where tools come into play. Because this LLM, for example, again, Claude, can now call a tool which could be DuckDuckGo, meaning a web browser. And it could say, hey, please go to AccuWeather or Google Weather or whatever and type in Berlin and tell me what the weather is. DuckDuckGo will do that and then return the response. In this case, context. That's how you call it. This context would now be, what was it again? 14 degrees. Our LLM would now have this new context, generate the output, and it would say, hey user, it's quite chilly in Berlin. Now, this was a relatively simple example or a re relatively simple tool, but you can have multiple tools, maybe a Stripe tool. This means you can interact with Stripe, get data from Stripe, or maybe your file system or maybe some sort of service like Sentry or stuff like that. So at the end of the day, you pretty much have your LLM and then you create a wrapper which connects to your tool, DuckDuckGo, Stripe, file system, whatever. Here's the problem. In a very simple use case, it's easy to implement. So let's imagine the following. You have one LLM and then one tool. You create one wrapper and voila, you are finished. Now let's take two tools. Well, you have to create two wrappers to connections. But now let's imagine the following. You create or you use 50 LLMs and you want to use thousands of tools. You want to use GitHub, so you want to connect to GitHub, you want to connect to your file system, to DuckDuckGo. Now you have to manage all of these connections, thousands of connections, and you have to write them yourself. But this isn't the biggest problem. I mean, writing it isn't that hard. The problem is maintaining it. Because let's imagine the following. Stripe comes and updates their tool or their API. You have to now update the wrapper for each individual LLM. Whew, that's a huge problem. Let's again take our initial example of GitHub. If GitHub would update their API, you would have to update each individual 
wrapper. Because if I open Cursor again, I can create a new repository with any LLM, with Claude, with for example Gemini, with GPT, with DeepSeek, with all of these LLMs. This means if I would be the developer of Cursor, I would create hundreds of connections, wrappers. And that's a huge problem because this is not maintainable and also not scalable. And let's imagine you have full automation. So tool one calls tool two, tool two calls tool 10 and tool 10 calls tool 50. If one breaks in the middle, everything breaks. So how can we fix this? We want you still call tools services, but we want to make all of this manageable and scalable. We need some sort of layer in the middle which can translate all of the mess for us and create a standardized pretty much process. Well, this is where MCP comes into play and MCP stands for Model Context Protocol. Model in this case refers to our LLM, Claude, GPT, DeepSeek, whatever, I don't really care. Then we have our context and our context is pretty much everything. I know this kind of sounds weird, but it's honestly everything, your input, but then you also have context types. The two main ones are tools and resources. So tools say what the model can do and resources is what you get. So for example, files and stuff like that. And then we have our protocol and this is pretty much the connector, the cable, which connects the MCP client to the MCP server. I know this sounds super confusing and it is at the start, trust me, I spent hours trying to understand everything. But let's quickly look at the documentation. This will already clear up a few things. So right here they say MCP, Model Context Protocol, is an open protocol that standardizes how applications provide context to LLMs. Think of MCP like a USB-C port for AI applications. Just just as USB-C provides a standardized way to connect your devices to various peripherals and accessories, MCP provides a standardized way to connect AI models to different data sources and tools. So what exactly is meant by this? text. Well, let's again go to version 2. As mentioned, we have one tool, like for example DuckDuckGo, and then we have our LLM. To connect these two, you could say interfaces, you have to create this wrapper. This wrapper, I guess, is kind of standardized because APIs have their rules. Nevertheless, every wrapper will still kind of work differently and you will have to write it differently. MCP, at the end of the day, is like a little universal connector. It's like a translator, like an ORM. As in Therefore, they use an USB-C cable. So let's imagine the following. You have, for example, Claude. This here is Claude, my keyboard. I know, very weird. So what I can do is I can just put my cable inside of here. This is now Claude and I want to now connect it to my tool. In this case, to DuckDuckGo. So here's my iPad, also USB-C. I put it inside of here, voila. This probably explodes in a second. No, I'm joking. We now have our connection and that's what MCP is. MCP is pretty much a transactional layer which standardizes the connection between your LLM or in other words, your LLMs with your tools. And the nice thing is the MCP server, which we get, is not something that we write. The MCP server is provided by the service that you want to use. So if you want to use, for example, Stripe, then Stripe will offer a MCP server server and then you can connect to it with the MCP client. And again, since at the end of the day the tool provides the server for you, it also has to manage it. Because with the version 2 example, we had to manage or we had to maintain this wrapper. But with the MCP layer or with the MCP architecture, the server is maintained by the service itself. But let's look at the MCP architecture in more detail. So here we have our MCP client, our MCP protocol and our MCP server. These are the three fundamental building blocks for the model context protocol. To understand the architecture better, we will start from the bottom. I know, a bit counterintuitive, but don't worry. So here we have three services, Google Drive, 
than my database using Postgres and Slack. As you all know, all of these services kind of have their own APIs. So Postgres uses SQL, Slack has its own API, and Google Drive also has its own API. And then we have our MCP servers. Here's the thing, each service has its own MCP server. And this MCP server pretty much knows everything about the service. So for example, about Slack. In Slack, you can create messages. These are your capabilities to create messages, to create groups, to tag people and stuff like that. In GitHub, the capabilities are to create a new repo, to create a branch, to delete a repo, to delete a branch and stuff like that. These are your capabilities. And that's why I wrote right here, MCP servers are lightweight programs that each so individually expose specific capabilities like deleting, creating, stuff like that through the standardized model context protocol. And then we have our MCP client. This is pretty much the interface that is connected to our LLM. So it could be anything to be honest with you, but in most cases, this is Cursor, Windsurf or Cloud Desktop. And this MCP client can talk to our servers, to our MCP servers. The nice thing is it can talk to multiple servers. So while in most cases we only have one MCP server per service, we can use our client to talk to multiple servers. So I could have a GitHub server, a Slack server and a Google Drive server for example and talk to them at the same time. And then at the end we also have our MCP protocol and this is like the USB-C cable. This is the connector. And with that we don't have these problems which we had in version 2 where every tool had its own language, its own return type and stuff like that. With the MCP protocol itself, so this protocol, the connector, we get the standardized language, the USB-C cable, which gives us all of the answers, all of the data, the context in one standardized way. So if we again take the analogy of the USB-C cable, then this would be my client. I can have one client, I can have multiple clients in theory, for example, Cursor and Claude Desktop. In this case, this will be Cursor. We have one connector, it connects easily, and then we have our MCP server. And since the protocol is standardized, each MCP server also can accept this, if I can get it to accept. Voila, this is MCP explained in basic terms. So now you might say, okay, Jan, I think I finally understand what MCP is, but how does it work in a real world example? So if we can go to the start, to the intro, how does it work internally with our GitHub MCP server? Well, it starts relatively simple. First of all, we have our user input. In this case, the user input is, hey, MCP server. Please create a brand new GitHub repository, make it private and call it yo subscribe. So this was our input. This goes through our MCP client. Then as a second step, our MCP client calls our MCP server and says, hey, what tools do you have? Our MCP server will say, hey, I have access to Slack. I have access to your database, to GitHub, to Google Drive. What do you need? Behind the scenes, it will just return an array. So we can write here, just say hey array and then in the array it will list all of the capabilities so it will say i don't know github create repo then it also has the capability github delete repo then for example slack create message so in the background it will just return an array with all of the capabilities then the mcp client will get this array and go over to our llm it will send over the question hey, create a repo, and it will also send the tools array, which we just had right here. Our LLM will now take this question, our tools, it will analyze everything, and it will say, hey, I want to use the GitHub tool or the GitHub server to create a brand new repo, because this is a capability that the server has. This means we can go back to the MCP client, the MCP client calls the MCP server, and the MCP server talks to our GitHub application, to our GitHub API, and creates this repo in the background. Once that's done, we can go back to our MCP client and then we again send a request to our LLM with the context. In this case, the context would be a successful message of, hey, created new private repo with the name yo subscribe. This LLM would now get this new context and then just return the output and the output would be, hey, we create or I created a brand new repo for you. 
And if I again open cursor, as you remember from the initial demo, I created a new repo with the GitHub MCP server. Let's again look at this flow and I will explain it using the chart we just used. So cursor is my MCP client. This could also be Windsurf or Cloud Desktop, it does not matter. Here's my input. My input goes through the MCP client cursor and this now sends my input, my request to my MCP servers. So in my settings, I have my my MCP servers list. I only have one MCP server and here you see all of the tools listed. I can create or update a file, search repositories, create repositories and do things like that. I can have multiple servers, a GitHub server, a Slack server, a I don't care server. At the end of the day, this MCP client will just go to each MCP server and get all of the tools. Here you see the tools. It will then send a tools array back to our LLM. It will send a question or the input, which I had right here, and send the tools array to the LLM. The LLM will analyze everything and then send another request to our MCP client with the tool which I want to use. So right here you see, I will help you to create a new private GitHub repository called Yo Subscribe. It then calls the MCP tool, the MCP server with the tool create repository. This means we send a request, so the MCP client sends a request to the MCP server, then the server calls the service itself, the API creates the repository and then we send at the end of the day new context back to the LLM and the LLM then creates this message, this output where it says everything was successful. As you see, it's actually not that complicated. At the start, it's complicated, yes, but maybe watch this video a second time. In total, you have about seven steps and it's abstracted for you, which is quite cool. So if you want to get started with MCP, here's what I would recommend you to do. In my opinion, you should first First of all, try out the GitHub MCP server to create a new repo or something like that. Setting it up is super simple because all you need is your GitHub personal access token. Create it, create this configuration and voila. Just go to YouTube and type uh, GitHub MCP cursor or something like that. You will find a tutorial. It's very easy to implement and try it out. It's a good start. After that, of course, you can try out more complex things, implement it in your own application, implement your own client, your own server, but I won't do it in this video. This was just the introduction to MCP. Let's also look at a few, not bad things, but a few things that you should know. So first of all, we are still early. MCP MCP, the architecture, the protocol was created by Anthropic at the end of 2024 in November, if I remember correctly. This means it's still not very mature, there's still things that are not figured out 100%. So for example, authorization is still a big problem. Therefore, in most cases, MCP servers are hosted locally due to these security issues. And now, if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It would mean a lot to me and my heart. So please do it. And now I hope I can see you in the next video. Enjoy your day and bye.